Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here in beautiful Seattle. Um, I'm going to start tonight, I realize there may be a number of people in the audience who uh, are familiar with Haiti and know it, but we uh, have a very short presentation which we'll give, just to give anybody who doesn't have uh, that background to fill in some of the gaps. Haiti, as you can see, is in the center of the Caribbean. It was the first large island that Columbus landed on in 1492. In fact, he crash landed on it uh, because his flagship, the uh, Santa Maria, sank off the northwest coast. They took the wreckage and they built the Navidad fort where he left his away team when he went back to Isabel and Ferdinand, for whom he named the island Hispaniola, Little Spain, because he found it so beautiful. Nobody's ever found the Navidad. It's been looked for for uh, decades, uh, never to be found. Uh, the island became the richest colony in the Western Hemisphere, dwarfing the output of uh, the other colonies and the 13 co English colonies of the um, North American continent. It uh, was really one of the corners of the triangle trade where essentially uh, uh, slaves were picked up in Africa, traded in Haiti for uh, sugar, and that was taken to uh, France where they would pick up guns and then they would head back down to Africa, pick up more slaves. So that was the triangle trade which made Haiti uh, really the engine that, that built the uh, French bourgeoisie. The uh, country uh, it became independent in 1804, and as uh, many of you heard, it had a devastating earthquake in uh, 2010, January 12th, uh, along the bottom of the uh, mouth of Haiti there, from Port-au-Prince to Léogane. Uh, the towns were essentially leveled. Uh, some 200 and uh, some 319,000 people were uh, said to be dead from that by the official Haitian government um, to have been killed in that earthquake according to official government figures. But a uh, statistician, statistician recently uh, reviewed the matter and, and came up with a figure of closer to 40 to 60,000. But nonetheless, it was a terrible blow to the country. Many thousands of buildings fell down, including the National Palace, most of the churches, many public schools, uh, burying people. Um, the uh, uh, city was, uh, uh, Port-au-Prince, the capital, was essentially destroyed. In many areas, like uh, in this slide, you see houses were built one on top of another. And one of the problems uh, became that houses would topple onto each other. And afterwards, uh, rebuilding is very difficult because there are no roads in there. It's down these little uh, paths, what they call corridor, uh, corridors. Uh, and so it's very difficult to rebuild in that area. Uh, many of the people who were displaced by the collapsed housing uh, moved to camps. It was about uh, one and a half million shortly after the quake. Uh, it is down now to about 500,000 people living in these tent and tarp camps uh, some two years later. These uh, are sprinkled around the metropolitan area and are largely uh, now uh, disintegrating under two years of uh, sun and rain. When the sun beats on them, they're like little ovens. You can just imagine it baking in one of those tents. And uh, when it rains, as it often does at night, they just leak and uh, are uh, of no use at all in stopping the rain. Uh, here's one of the largest camps in Port-au-Prince in the uh, Jean-Marie Vincent camp down in central Port-au-Prince near the old military airport. A lot of them, as you can see, have developed into little towns. They have uh, lottery offices like that little booth you see off to the right, um, little stores and uh, beauty salons, barber shops, etc. Here are the figures on it. There's, as you can see, as of September, there were about 800 camps, but those are now uh, being reduced. Uh, there uh, is 
a campaign by the new government of Michel Martelly, the new president, to buy people out. He gives them 20,000 or 21,000 gourds. That comes to about 500 or $525 uh, to move out. Uh, sometimes uh, police come in or sometimes just deputized goons uh, and force people out. But many of them are really being uh, laid siege to. Their supplies, which were being brought in by NGOs, have been cut off. So uh, water, toilets uh, have been cut uh, down to 7%, 38% respectively. As you can see, as of September, that's down even lower now. So people are having to leave uh, in great numbers from those camps. And where many of them end up are on these um, settlements of shelters, I won't call them houses, built outside of the city. This is a camp called the most famous one, known as Corai Ceseles, which is essentially built in the desert out uh, north of the capital. Uh, that is uh, uh, between two uh, dumping grounds uh, from the coups, uh, the Tintayen and Mon Cabrit, uh, very desolate area. It's uh, es essentially a floodplain. Uh, the white rocks that are at the soil are, make the area very hot and bright during the day, and uh, when it rains, the waters flood through there. Uh, you can see it in the upper uh, right-hand corner there. That's about where it is, and it requires two or sometimes three fares to get into Port-au-Prince. It takes hours, so it's not a place where anybody can find work. Uh, they're trying to take uh, Korean investors and build an assembly factory out there to give the people work, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. That's uh, the cheap labor solution that they're proposing for Haiti, which is uh, no solution at all. Outside of the camps, you see these large informal communities developing, people who had originally come to take advantage of the services provided to the uh, camps by the NGOs. Uh, uh, water, toilets, and now, of course, those have been cut off, and so these camps are left with nothing, but they remain out in the fields, and uh, people really have nowhere to go back. Uh, this, this picture, by the way, is, looks exceptionally green. Uh, it was shortly after some rains. Uh, generally, the hills of that area are much browner. The housing that remains, uh, if you drive around Port-au-Prince, you'll see it will have red, yellow, or green markings on them. And uh, as you can see by this uh, study that was done, the bar study, uh, only half of Haiti's houses are really safe, uh, with the other uh, half being basically uh, ready to, should be demolished or should be repaired. Nonetheless, people are moving back into them in early 2011. 64% of them is, uh, had families moving back in, and 85% of the yellow-coated, which Kit Miyamoto said was an extremely dangerous situation, and indeed it is, because uh, hurricanes or earthquakes could uh, cause disaster in that case. This is a picture of a cholera, a field cholera clinic. Cholera, Haiti is now the worst cholera epidemic in the world, a country which didn't know cholera uh, uh, two years ago, but in October 2010, Nepalese troops with the UN mission to stabilize Haiti, as the, UN, as the U.S. occupation forces called, imported cholera into Haiti by allowing their sewage to leak into the headwaters of the uh, Artibani River, Haiti's largest river, and from there it spread throughout the country. Over 7,000 people have now died from that epidemic. Uh, five, over 500,000 people have been sickened. And uh, with the rainy season coming in April, the situation will get much worse. When the rains come, the waterborne disease of cholera spreads, and it is uh, still ravaging the country. It's uh, interesting to note that cholera funding is about $130 million, which is uh, about one eight, uh, eight times less than the $850 million spent each year on the UN military deployment of 10 to 13,000 UN troops. But here's what the uh, aid figures show. 
that uh, about half of the $5 billion, which was pledged in a March 2010 UN meeting, has been uh, dispersed. That doesn't mean it reached, has reached people. It just means the agencies or governments have released it. And um, uh, nonetheless, uh, only about 10% of that actually gets to the people, or to the government, I should say. Uh, and the other 90% is often bled off. Usually, most of that uh, recovery aid is in fact going to the State Department, the Pentagon, contractors, or the NGOs themselves. Uh, so this is the situation of aid in the country, one which is dysfunctional, basically. Here is a picture of the embryonic Haitian army. There are 10 of these informal camps around the country. These are former Haitian soldiers former death squad members, former, uh, or people who want to be soldiers, being trained. Uh, this was one of the planks of uh, President Michel Martelly's um, campaign. He is a neo-devalurist, has the soldiers as his base. He was the cheerleader of the 2004 and 1991 coups against former President Jean-Bertrand Aristide. The army used to be called the Force Armée d'Haïti, or the Haitian Armed Forces, for Armed Forces of Haiti, the FAD. And um, it was disbanded by Aristide in 1995 because it carried out, uh, primarily carried out coups against uh, governments which uh, were not following the dictates of either Washington or the ruling class in Haiti. And hence, uh, he dissolved it. They are now, their role in Haiti is being fulfilled now by UN peacekeepers. As I mentioned before, about 10 to 13,000. There are about 10,000 now. They pump, pop them up to 13 shortly after the uh, earthquake. In fact, they had sent 22,000 US troops. In addition, they were so worried the people were going to rise up. Uh, but um, the UN troops have uh, been deployed around Haiti. They've committed several massacres, uh, the most notable being uh, two, uh, one in July 2005 and the other in December 2006, in which dozens of people were killed. Their bodies often disappeared. Many of the families didn't get the bodies of the young men killed back from those massacres. And, um, the Haitian people want them out. They want them out of the country, particularly since they've imported cholera into the country. And because of these uh, 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 massacres, and also because there are regular account, uh, 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 events of sexual abuse. Um, earlier this summer, um, Ansel Hertz, Ansel, are you here? Uh, Ansel, who is uh, living here, is from Seattle. Uh, help break a story about um, four Uruguayan uh, uh, UN soldiers who sodomized a young Haitian man, 18 year, 18 year old man in the southern town of Port Salut. This was all captured on a phone and the video was given to ABC News. It went like wild, wildfire uh, around Haiti and around the world. Uh, just last week, uh, two more cases in Gonaive and Port-au-Prince were identified of uh, uh, soldiers carrying out sexual abuse. We don't have the uh, details then. Back in 2007, they had to ship home close to 200 Sri Lankan troops for abusing young girls as young as nine years old. In sharp contrast, we have the mission of the Cubans in Haiti. The Cubans for the past 13 years have deployed on average about 800 doctors around the country in the countryside. You see the different places there. The little red dots are uh, the smaller ones out in the uh, deep countryside. Uh, these are, um, this is an effort that has won the enduring uh, uh, thanks of the Haitian people. They, they really view the Cuban doctors as gods who have brought uh, free health care, tend to them in the deep countryside, often with very few uh, 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 implements or medicine. If you would like to keep a 
track of, uh, keep abreast of events in Haiti and uh, what's happening there. One of the most effective solidarity networks, in fact, is the Canadian Haiti Action Network, uh, which runs a website which keeps a lot of the English language and French language uh, information on it. Um, they, in fact, have sponsored my tour through um, uh, Canada and now in Seattle. Uh, they carry all the WikiLeaks documents, which we'll be talking about shortly on their website, and have um, uh, a, just a, a wealth of information that you can find there. Uh, Canada Haiti Action ca or you can google chan uh, canada haiti action network if you want some books to read on haiti there there are uh, a few that have just come out there's tectonic shifts that uh, was just mentioned uh, also laurent dubois is a um, uh, professor at uh, duke university in north carolina He's just published The Aftershocks of History, which is a fantastic account, which has really um, uh, speaks back to the popular myth that Haiti is a basket case, uh, it can't help itself, and it shows really how it has been uh, a, a, a wellspring of uh, innovation and uh, uh, intellect uh, and um, great wealth, as it was for the uh, French uh, colonial empire. Uh, uh, Paul Farmer's book, Haiti After the Earthquake, is also a very moving account. Um, uh, but one of the most important books, if you really want to understand the 2004 coup d'etat, is Damning the Flood uh, by Peter Hallward. He's a um, professor of philosophy from uh, Britain, but has written uh, one of the great uh, historical accounts of uh, Haiti. Presently, uh, what we're experiencing in Haiti is a restoration of the Duvalier regime, which was uh, overthrown 25 years ago. Last year, former president for life, Jean-Claude Duvalier, returned. Uh, he said that he wanted to be of help to the country, but uh, the investigating judge an investigating judge put him under house arrest and began to review a dossier to see what to do about close to a billion dollars that he stole from the Haitian treasury, the treasury of the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But above all, the thousands, even tens of thousands of people who were illegally imprisoned, executed, tortured, and disappeared during his 15 year reign from 1971 to 1986. Just two days ago, the judge released the findings of his investigation and announced his indictment, which he said would just be for the money stole, stolen, which would carry a maximum sentence of five years. And the crimes against humanity which have no statute of limitations on them, he cast aside as unnecessary. Well, of needless to say, this has brought a tremendous backlash from human rights groups, from Amnesty International to Human Rights Watch to many Haitian human rights groups, all of them uh, crying foul, calling for appeal. But really this, was possible because the government of Michel Martelly was in place. And on several occasions, most recently at the big capitalist conclave in Davos, Switzerland, uh, Martelly announced that he was contemplating a pardon of Duvalier. Not that you can pardon a uh, crime against humanity. That's not possible. But he said he would. And so he created some kind of pressure on the judge, some sort of notion that there needed to be reconciliation. And um, the uh, world responded with outrage. He backtracked the next few days, but nonetheless, the damage was already done. The irony to this is that the judge put a house arrest order on Duvalier, but almost every night, any night during the week, you could see him in the best restaurants of Pétionville, the bourgeoisie's 
quarter in, above Port-au-Prince in the cool mountain heights, uh, eating with a large security detail and many well-wishers. In contrast, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the former slum parish priest who was elected really in response to Duvalier's reign in 1990, returned to Haiti after seven years of exile and was received by some 10,000 Haitians who poured out spontaneously. They were basically uh, 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 demobilized by the government radios which said, oh no, Aristide's not coming back. But when he came back within about 10, 20 minutes, tens of thousands had massed outside the airport and this human wave carried him from the airport to his home in Tabar, about two miles away. It was an incredible outpouring, and I've seen a lot of outpourings in Haiti, and this was one of them. But the irony is that Aristide, who came back to this acclaim, has himself actually been under house arrest. While Duvalier, under house arrest, circulates freely, Aristide cannot leave his home. He has not left his home since he returned in March of last year. So this is the reality of Haiti today. President Martelly is facing some crises of his own. He's been accused of very severe charges of corruption. For instance, to give you a taste of it, the dossier is very large. We can talk about it more if we'd like. He has quadrupled the per diem fee that a president gets when he travels abroad. And President Martelly travels abroad a great deal. The Haitian president used to get $5,000 a day. Martelly put it at $20,000 a day. His wife, if she travels with him, gets $10,000 a day. If his children travel with him, as they often do, they get $7,500 a day. If some of his colleagues and friends, what he calls counselors, he gives them those titles, travel with him, they get $4,000 a day. And Martelly rarely travels without a huge retinue of people, not 15 or 20 as is customary, but 30. So these junkets that he's taken have been huge cash machines, uh, giant ATMs on wheels which travel around the globe to Davos, Ireland, etc. That's where he just came back from. So we have this on the one hand, but to top it all off, the cherry on top, if you will, is that it appears he is a US citizen, which is in stark violation of the Haitian Constitution, which says you have to be a Haitian citizen who has never renounced your nationality. Well, about um, seven months ago, we found one of his family members who was willing to talk to us at Haiti Liberté and they told us that he'd had a passport, that he'd been a U.S. citizen since 1993 or 1995. We didn't run with the story because uh, we could never confirm it. We called the State Department. I could say we could never explicitly confirm it. We called the State Department, we asked them. We said, is he a citizen? And they hemmed and hawed quite a bit saying, there's privacy laws, we can't tell you that. But finally, they gave us an answer. And textually, word for word, their answer was, to the best of our knowledge, we have no reason to believe that President Martelly is now or has ever been a US citizen. Well, we took that as a yes, because it's a simple yes or no question. Look at your computer, look at the papers. Does he have a passport or not? It's not to the best of your knowledge, or you have no reason to believe. So we took it as a yes, but we still didn't run with it. But recently, a uh, Haitian senator has begun to delve to the bottom of it using a Haitian investigative method. He uh, turned up Martelly's, or one of Martelly's former mistresses in the Dominican Republic. Remember, he was a uh, compas singer in his previous incarnation who had uh, many mistresses around the globes, 
around the globe, and she uh, was mad, and she had a canceled passport, a canceled U.S. passport of his, which she provided to uh, Senator Moise Jean-Charles. At least this is what he said. We cannot state definitively that this is the case because we have not seen at Haiti Liberté the actual passport. He has given the passport to a Senate commission investigating Martelly's uh, citizenship and that of 39, 38 other government officials. And if this proves true, I, I should say that this commission was headed by Senator Moïse Jean-Charles, who uh, has been a very aggressive uh, and dogged uh, researcher in this matter. But they carried out a coup in the commission, so two of Martelly's parliamentary allies are now in charge of the commission, and they've said that this document, this copy of the passport of the canceled U.S. passport uh, cannot be given to the press. Uh, we are nonetheless trying to find the mistress in Dominican Republic and get a copy for ourselves, so stay tuned to the Haiti Liberté website for that. But this will cause a tremendous crisis in the government if it's determined that Martelly is a U.S. citizen because he will be called upon to resign. However, this could end up being a huge confrontation. Martelly, in a 1997 article with a Miami paper, when he was already contemplating his presidency, said, the first thing I'll do as president is dissolve the parliament, because you can't get anything done with a parliament. So it's very likely if the parliament come and say, comes and says, President Martelly, you have to step down, that he will say, no. You have to step down, Parliament. So we're waiting to see if this will happen. It's just speculation at this point, but uh, the ingredients are starting to come together. In this week's Haiti Liberté, we look at the review process that is beginning, and they're starting to find that, indeed, many of the members of the 39 flagged by Senator Moise are indeed U.S. or foreign nationals or have dual nationality. So this is the crisis that is brewing. Haiti Liberté found an easier way to get a clear answer out of the State Department uh, this past summer, and that was through WikiLeaks cables, which were provided to the newspaper by WikiLeaks. Uh, it was a great honor. As many of you may know, the 250,000 secret U.S. diplomatic cables that they came into possession of were originally given to four mainstream media. The New York Times, The Guardian in England, Der Spiegel in Germany, and Le Monde in France. But those big media did practically nothing with the documents. In fact, the New York Times boasted, boasted that they'd received clearance from the State Department before they published any of their articles on the WikiLeaks documents. That gives you some idea of the servility and timidity with which they approached them. So WikiLeaks decided to adopt a new strategy. They said, we're going to go to the press in the countries concerned by them and give them the documents. So we're very proud that they chose Haiti Liberté as the uh, media to release the documents and to edit them because we had to go through the documents and remove names, uh, block out the names of people who might have their lives or livelihoods threatened by uh, the revelations made therein. It was a very uh, cloak and dagger operation receiving the documents. Remember, WikiLeaks began as a hacker organization. They knew a great deal about internet security and they said, no, we cannot email you <laughs> the documents. We have to deliver them to you in hand. 
and not just deliver them. When they came, it was a team of three, uh, and they gave us training in how to uh, receive the documents, how to put them on a computer that wasn't connected to the internet so we couldn't be hacked in by Pentagon or uh, State Department hackers, uh, to uh, all sorts of password protocols. In fact, we were finally put on a secure uh, video link with Julian Assange, who explained to us how to take a small thumb drive they'd given us and put it in with a pass key and decrypt the documents, which finally we did. And what we got were 1,918 documents, which were marked Haiti by the State Department. Now, this doesn't mean they came from the Haitian embassy. Uh, in fact, it means that any communication throughout the U.S. diplomatic service, it might be from Ottawa to Washington or the Vatican to Washington or Paris to Haiti, all of these that involved Haiti would be marked HA and we got them. Well, when we heard that the documents before we'd received them spanned from March 2003 to February 2010, we were overjoyed because finally we knew we'd get a, a glimpse into the intrigues that happened at the embassy in the 2004, February 29, 2004, overthrow and kidnapping of President Aristide. Much to our dismay and disappointment when we got the documents, we found that the period from 2003 up through March 2005 from the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince was not there. We asked Julian Assange, we said, what happened? <laughs> where, where are our cables that we're looking for? And he said, that most likely they were a higher security level. The classification for our documents were from a confidential, more or less, through several degrees up until secret. But it's believed that the other documents may have been top secret or ultra top secret. Of course, these cables are one of the lowest levels of secrecy. So those uh, documents were finally uh, combed through by our team. And we found a number of stories which uh, were of great interest nonetheless. And what they essentially showed was how the US Embassy has, over these years, been working as the handmaiden and ringleader of US corporate interests in Haiti. And the one we started off with was the story of Petro Caribe, where Venezuela came to Haiti and said, we'll provide all your energy needs. 14,000 barrels of oil a day. You pay 60% up front, 40% you pay over 25 years at 1% interest. Saves the country $100 million a year. And even the US Embassy had to admit in the cables that this was a tremendous uh, boon to the country. But they nonetheless worked with Texaco Chevron Exxon Mobil to torpedo the Petro Caribe deal. It took them two years on the very day that President Rene Preval was inaugurated in 2006. He went straight from the podium where he delivered the inaugural speech to a room in the palace. The press was invited and there he signed with Vice President uh, Rangel of Venezuela the Petro Caribe deal. It wasn't for two years that that oil could begin flowing. And that was due solely to US Embassy sabotage. They also sabotaged efforts of Haitian parliamentarians to raise the minimum wage to $5 a day. Assembly workers were being paid $1 and change a day to assemble electronics, and clothing for labels like Hanes, Fruit of the Loom, Gap, Levi Strauss. And this effort by the parliamentarians to raise the minimum wage to $5 a day still would have been the lowest minimum wage in the Western Hemisphere. They fought it, and they won this time. 
They won, at least temporarily, and got President Preval to intervene and put it down to $3 a day. It's all outlined in the uh, WikiLeaks pieces we did. The other areas, and you can check them, they're on the Chan website that I showed you, very well laid out. We have them also on the Haiti Liberté site, but the Chan website does actually a better job of laying them out. We looked at how they tried to block Aristide's return in conjunction with Canada and France, the Vatican, to keep him from returning. For seven years, he was in exile in South Africa. Uh, we looked at how they helped integrate paramilitaries into the police force, the police force which was supposed to keep the peace. So they put people who had been coup makers, paramilitary coup makers, into the police force. We looked at the earthquake aid, how they deployed without any Haitian government clearance, 22,000 troops, and then went and badgered any journalists around the world who criticized their, their efforts. Um, so this is the nature of the problems in Haiti today. Haiti was in many ways a vanguard nation throughout these past two centuries in the Americas. As all of you probably know, it was the first and last successful slave revolution. Cuba, next door, their great revolutionary leader was Jose Marti. His birthday was celebrated just at the end of January. And one of his closest allies in the Caribbean was a Haitian president called Antonor Fermé. And Fermé was a leading intellectual of his day and of his time who inspired legions of uh, uh, pan-Caribbeanists and anti-imperialists in the following years in fighting the hegemon, the growing hegemon to the north. And Antonor Fermé became close friends with Jose Marti. In fact, Marti, he left on his final voyage to Cuba in 1895 from the port of Cape Haitian. And uh, one month later in May, he was killed in battle fighting for a free Cuba. And in this, this has been the role of Haiti throughout history. It was the first nation to foil U.S. election engineering in 1990 with the election of President Aristide. Up until then, the U.S. basically had been able to successfully apply their formula where they would back a candidate through their National Endowment for Democracy with millions of dollars. And just like here, the candidate who spends the most wins but it didn't work in Haiti. It foundered. And a priest who was outspent 64 to 1 by the US candidate won the election in a landslide. And it changed history. It was then that Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Evo Morales in Bolivia and Correa in Ecuador and even Lula in Brazil began to look and say, wow, we can, we can do that. Build a vast front and just take those elections. Make it Make it possible. So Haiti has been this, this leader, and we, we owe it that respect. And we should always remember the words of Antonor Fermé on his deathbed when he said, a people can live only so long under tyranny, injustice, illiteracy, and misery. And then one day they'll rise up. Thank you. Uh, you seem to be fairly against uh, Martelli, and I'm curious, who would you have backed in, the, uh, in last year's election? Well, I think, first and foremost, uh, as Aristide said on his arrival, the, it was an exclusionary election. Haitians call it a selection, not an election. Um, I think that the Provisional Electoral Council of Haiti should have been allowed to decide. Uh, essentially, the first round of the elections were a total mess, totally uh, fraud-filled, violence-marred mess. And um, the results of that 
in fact, what happened was all the candidates got together in a big press conference the same day and said, none of us uh, are going to participate in this. Then the head of the UN mission called Martelly and Mirlan Maringa and said, you guys are ahead. You're going to win. Don't pull out. And they flipped. They, they abandoned everybody else and they said, okay, we'll, we'll get on board if you're going to have us win. And um, the results that the Electoral Council handed down had Mirlan Maniga first and Jude Celestin, the candidate of the Inite party of former President René Preval, come in second with Martelly close third. Well, at that point, the OAS and U.S. intervened, meddled in the Haitian election, and basically overruled the Electoral Council, which has, by the Constitution, is the final arbiter of, electorals, uh, of electoral matters. And they said, no, you're going to put Martelly in number two, which happened, but not with the Electoral Council's grace. And the Electoral Council had to vote, uh, a majority vote, to approve the first round results, uh, which it never did. So essentially, that second round election that was held on March 20th, 2011 was illegal. So the first thing I would say would be there should have been exclusionary election, uh, 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 inclusionary elections, including inclusive elections, including the Lavalas family. Uh, second, the Electoral Council should have been able to exercise its sovereign right to conduct elections as it sees fit. And um, that would have been the, the result. But Martelly uh, essentially was, to our mind, imposed by the U.S. and OAS. Yeah. This government is corrupt from, from what you've described and, and other things I've read. Um, but on the other hand, it is the existing government and how, how could you see the money handled in a, in a transparent, accountable, you know, really productive way? Well, we totally agree with Paul Farmer. And um, no matter what we think of the Martelly government, uh, we think as a matter of principle, they, the, the Haitian government, whatever the Haitian government is, should be the one conducting and leading the aid effort and all efforts in Haiti. Essentially, since the 1990s, if you read the USAID reports, they've been looking for ways to circumvent the state, the central government, to weaken it, to destroy it. Uh, we see the security of the country in the hands of foreigners. We see the aid of the, to the country in the hands of foreigners. We see the administration of the country uh, in the hands of foreigners. So you have uh, a weakened state, and as a matter of principle, we feel that this has to be uh, the changed. It has to be the state. That is the only thing that the Haitian people can vote in, put in, and have uh, a say over. They can't do that with an NGO, or with a foreign government, or with the IMF, or with the World Bank. It's only with their own government. If the, if the Haitian government is corrupt and doesn't do the right thing with the aid, that's then for the Haitians to figure out what to do about that government. And so th to us, uh, it's the essential problem in Haiti today is that these foreign uh, forces are essentially taking over the country and, and denying it its self-determination. Thanks a lot, Kim. I really appreciate your time today. And um, as you know, I was in Haiti um, during the earthquake with my family. Uh, when the earthquake hit, we started um, whatever medical relief we could provide at our hotel. Um, and it was incredible to read the WikiLeaks cable that says the gold rush is on uh, from the U.S. Embassy. Um, that's what they're thinking about, how to make money off of the situation while there's mm -hmm. one of the worst tragedies in, in history. Um, and one thing that while I was in Haiti, I wrote an article from the airport while I was there um, because I talked to a, a, one of 
um, and of a guy who's working with an evacuation service, and he was getting airplane evacuating people out to the DR um, mm -hmm. on flights, and he said that he was not able to run one of his flights because uh, Hillary Clinton was coming in to give a speech. So they grounded everything for three hours in the airport. So that meant they they didn't allow aid to come in to Haiti for those three hours. And this is the fifth day after the earthquake when there's still people trapped and who could be saved um, if aid is flowing continuously. So he said his flights were not able to get you know badly injured people um, evacuated. And, and then he said another flight was grounded so that she could get a suit flown in from the DR uh, for a change of clothes uh, for another uh, a media appearance she was making. So we, we know that everything she was saying was just rhetoric and that's how they work. But one thing I read in your documents uh, really struck home because when I wrote that article, I got an email uh, very soon after from someone threatening a lawsuit that I, um, you know, insinuated things um, and spoke poorly of the secretary. And, um, I, you know, I was worried about it, but nothing came of it. And then I think it was in your reporting, or I don't know if it was somewhere else, but I think it was in your reporting that the U.S. Embassy uh, put out a cable saying, um, please keep us informed of any uh, articles about Haiti that speak negatively of the U.S. aid relief effort and and deal with that problem. And That's exactly right. That, yeah, that was Ansel's that right? piece on the post oh, earthquake that was response. Piece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you for uh, revealing that because it made clear where this random threat came from. Right, trying to silence voices <laughs> that were pointing out um, you know, the the horrible job the U.S. did um, in the aid relief that. You know, when you talked about tens of thousands of people dying in this earthquake, well, thousands of them died directly in the earthquake, but tens of thousands more died because they didn't get water or food in the first three, five days, mm -hmm. and they were trapped under. So I greatly appreciate that reporting, and I just want to know what we, people in this room that want to continue to challenge our government, uh, because as you said, the, the foreign intervention is the main problem of this greatly wealthy uh, area of the world that can take care of its own problems. What can we do to challenge our government to stay out of, out of their affairs? Yeah. Well, that's, um, <clears throat> the, as uh, Roger said, there is the Canada Haiti Action Network. I think you, Jesse, are involved with mobilizations here in um, Seattle area, and there are people who are aware of this uh, throughout um, the country uh, about uh, the U.S.'s heavy hand. And uh, we have to just keep our wits about us. If you listen to President, former President Clinton talk, you'll suspect that he's of the same opinion that we have. But in fact, um, he is facilitating the program that was essentially the program of Jean-Claude Duvalier 30 years ago when I made uh, the film Bitter Cain in Haiti under the Duvalier dictatorship. We looked at how the program of the government was essentially had two pillars, sweatshops and tourism. And that is now the formula once again, 30 years later, the same formula, sweatshops and tourism. And ironically, like one of the reports which we published in uh, Haiti Liberté, which was produced by Haiti Grassroots Grass Grass Watch, was on the Caracol assembly complex they're putting up in the north. This was built on the region's most fertile land. It's destroying a, a virgin mangrove forest, a coral reef. The UN groups that studied the project and were uh, making recommendations about it, said that area provided $1.3 billion of value to Haiti, however they quantify that. Uh, and this is now being paved over to put in a factory where people would be paid five bucks a day. It's gonna produce another Cité Soleil in the area. It's not the type of development. It's been shown over and over again that this uh, sweatshop development does not bring development. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. This, is, this has been really very, very helpful. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Um, the Lavalis movement, um, 
has that fractured? Is it still together? Is it still one party? Are there other parties that are progressive that are, are doing things in Haiti? And the second one is, um, do the Haitian workers have unions? And if they do, how strong are they or what kind of role are they playing? Okay. The Lavalas movement is um, beginning to get its, the Lavalas party, I should say, because there is a distinction between the Lavalas movement, which is the broader democratic movement that began in 1986 in the Femi Lavalas Party, which was the party formed in 1996 with uh, President Aristide as its leader. Uh, the party itself is reorganizing. It's now holding uh, uh, congresses in the departments of Haiti. Those are like states. Uh, there are 10 of them throughout the country in the buildup for a national congress, which I was told was supposed to be around March 20th. I don't think it's going to happen on March 20th. Maybe it'll be in May or June or July. But sometime this year, we expect to see a Lavalas family part, uh, party congress. And at that time, they are supposed to uh, announce a new leadership. Uh, Aristide will be stepping back. Uh, he is looking to become some kind of Nelson Mandela-like figure, I believe. Uh, from my discussions with him last April. Uh, that's what I sense. And he uh, is looking to pass the torch, if you will, to a new leadership. The party has not spoken out a great deal about Martelly, has not responded to many of his uh, programs. It's been quite prudent, I would say too prudent in that respect. But uh, they do expect to go into elections, and if they do, are likely to uh, have the same sort of response, very favorable, that they've had in the past. As for unions, I should also th say there are other initiatives happening at the base, at the grassroots levels, to start organizations which will be more engaged. A lot of that is happening in our office, at the Haiti Liberté office, which is combined with the Bureau of International Lawyers. A lot of groups meet there every day, every week, uh, huge meetings discussing uh, strategies. And there's been a lot of talk of starting another party or initiative or front, but nobody wants to really get in front of the Lavalas family until it's clear which way they're going. So as for uh, unions, Frankly, most of the unions in Haiti are either yellow unions or phantom unions. There is a union, Bataille which has done good work in some of the uh, assembly factories. Uh, they've had a politically confused stance in some cases. They supported the coup of 2004, which has earned them a lot of scorn from portions of the uh, progressive movement worldwide, but they have done some good organizing work. And there are other unions like the CATH, and the, uh, which has some internal problems. It basically has two heads, two factions, but it is also a um, union which functions on some levels. So the union movement, we cannot say is strong, but uh, the will is there if, if uh, it, one of their problems is that it's very hard for Haitians to pay dues. I mean, <laughs> $5 a day, how much are you going to pay in dues from that, so. You uh, talked about the <coughs> devastating effect that cholera is having on the general population. I think you mentioned that over 7,000 people have died and there's over 500,000 that has been infected. I just would like to know what has happened to those people that have been infected. And also, one more question is that I saw this documentation where they showed these big warehouses. And they were stuffed with everything from baby pacifiers to big trucks for delivering goods and stuff. What has happened to that stuff? Is it still sitting in the warehouse? Is it there because people are greedy, incompetent, or they just don't care? For the first question, of the 500,000, one of the important things to know is that the Bureau for international lawyers and the international, uh, 
the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti have launched a lawsuit on behalf of 5,000 of the victims of cholera. Those are people who either had cholera or had family members die from cholera. They collected 5,000 of them and they launched a lawsuit against the United Nations demanding reparations for Haiti from the United Nations for bringing cholera to Haiti. We'll see what happens. The UN has never officially recognized its responsibility in bringing, importing cholera into Haiti, and this lawsuit aims to rectify that. But cholera is a disease of poverty, and when you have slums which have open sewers running through them, the mud uh, filled with cholera bacteria when there's a heavy rainstorm, it's very difficult to control this. So it is an epidemic which is going to be plaguing Haiti for, I think, decades to come. It is a real human tragedy. And uh, as for the materials that you saw, I'm not sure what has happened, but I think the problem with aid has been that there are a lot of NGOs which are in a, uh, I could call it a racket. They make money off of <laughs> this charity, and I think a lot of aid has been wasted in this way. It's even dumped. I've seen it even in Brooklyn, New York, where one of our offices is. We have an office in Port-au-Prince, but one in Brooklyn as well. And I once saw a uh, warehouse of a church which had done a collection for Haiti, uh, filled with things like you're saying, toys and discarded clothes. And eventually they ended up dumping it because they never could get it shipped to Haiti. So people had brought it in. So I think there's a huge problem with the aid uh, going to Haiti and um, I think when people do give, you should do it judiciously to organizations which have a track record of uh, effectiveness.